Well, I want to talk about perspective today. Let me give you the definition of perspective. Perspective, it's a particular attitude toward or a way of regarding something. It's a point of view. Perspective, it's important. Our perspectives determine how we live our lives. Like one person said, we can complain because rose bushes have thorns or rejoice because thorns have roses. Depends on your perspective, right? I love what George Carlin says. He said, some people see the glass half full, others see it half empty. I see a glass that's twice as big as it needs to be. That's perspective. I love comedian Stephen Wright's perspective. He says, everywhere is walking distance, if you have the time. <laughs> but I love Og Medino, author Og Medino's uh, perspective when he says, I love the light for it shows me the way. Yet I will endure the darkness, for it shows me the stars. Paul Azinger was at the height of his professional golf career when a doctor told him that he had life-threatening cancer. Up to that moment, he had not given much thought to dying. Life was too all-consuming for him to stop and consider the reality of the grave and life beyond. But that encounter with the inevitability of, uh, inevitability of eternity was an abrupt reality check. His life, Paul's life, would never be the same again. Even with the millions of dollars he had made on the PGA Tour, it paled in comparison in the light of eternity. All he could think about was what the chaplain of the PGA Tour had said when he said, we think that we are in the land of the living, heading towards the land of the dying, when in reality, we're in the land of the dying, and we're headed for the land of the living. Paul Azinger's perspective on life had been viewed most of his life through a temporal view. And for the first time in his life, his perspective was shifting towards the eternal. Here's the fact, friends. How we view the eternal determines how we live in the temporal. This is what it says in Hebrews chapter 11. It says, it was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be treated as the grandson of the king, but chose to share ill treatment with God's people instead of enjoying fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought, he thought it was better to suffer for the promised Christ than to own all the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking forward to the great reward that God would give him. Simply put, because Moses lived with an eternal perspective, it made Moses' temporal life look much different. Think of the great things that Moses did in his life. Moses helped free the Hebrew people from slavery in Egypt, the most powerful nation in the world at the time. He, he led this huge mass of refugees through the desert, kept order, and brought them to the border of their future home in Canaan. Moses received the Ten Commandments from God and delivered them to the people. Under divine inspiration, he authored the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And none of those things would have happened unless Moses chose a perspective early in his life to live with an eternal view. Living life with an eternal view radically alters yours and my world. Our values, our time, our possessions, our money, our struggles. Uh, sometimes people will say this. They'll say, well, I'm physically here right now. Living for eternity stops me from living in the present. Yet history has shown us that that is not true. Henry Nouwen said the spiritual life, the eternal life, does not remove us from this world, but it leads us deeper into it. You know, why is it that nothing in this life can bring us the ultimate joy and contentment we seek but can never find? Why? Because we were built for eternity. As Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, God has planted eternity in the hearts of men. Today, if you sense you are missing something in your life that you had expected more, then perhaps you've been living life with the wrong perspective, with the wrong view. As Pascal said, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator made known through Jesus Christ. Moses somehow knew when he was a young man that all the riches from Pharaoh, from Egypt, 
that were readily available to him would not bring him the purpose in life God had saved and made him for. He chose a more difficult perspective, but a world-changing perspective, an eternal perspective. I love what G.K. Chesterton once said. He said, I had been told over and over again that I was in the right place. But I still felt depressed, even in acquiescence. But when I heard that I was in the wrong place, my soul sang for joy like a bird in spring. I knew now why I could feel homesick at home. You see, with the temporal view, when we live life with a temporal perspective, questions have few answers, crises become all-consuming, our pleasures become fleeting, we lose all perspective on the big picture. Our view becomes too narrow. Children get this way. When my daughter Larissa was four, she was having a tough day. We wouldn't let her watch her eighth episode of Barney. We wouldn't let her have Mountain Dew at 9.30 at night. She'd drawn all over her face with a red marker. She called it makeup. She'd fallen on the ground throwing a fit. We gave her a timeout in her bedroom. I went in to check on her, and she had moved her chair into the closet. I looked in the closet, and she's sitting there with her arms crossed, and that little four-year-old looks at me with total frustration, and she says, Daddy, I'm not having a very good life. She'd lost total perspective. That's what four-year-olds do. But friends, I have seen too many people, Christians included, especially over this past year, who are acting like my four-year-old daughter, Larissa. They have lost total perspective. This present world makes sense. It makes sense only when we live life with an eternal view, a view which radically changes our thoughts, our attitudes, and our actions. C.S. Lewis said this beautiful thing, hope is one of the theological virtues. This means that a continual look forward to the eternal world is not a form of escapism or wishful thinking, but one of the things a Christian is meant to do. It does not mean that we are to leave the present world as it is. If you read history, you will find that the people who did the most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. Let me get really practical right now, okay? When we begin to live with this kind of perspective, when we begin to live with the perspective, as the PGA uh, a chaplain said, when we begin to live with the perspective that we are in the land of the dying, headed towards the land of the living, it begins to radically change four aspects of our lives. Number one is this, our posture towards God changes. Our posture changes to a posture of surrender. We surrender to his wisdom, his purpose, his way, his life. We surrender our need for control, for approval, for temporary securities and pleasures. We live in a posture of humility because as Paul said in Romans 8, what can we ever say to such wonderful things as these? If God is on our side, who can ever, ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son for us, but gave him up for us all, won't we also surely give us, won't he surely give us everything else? It's a posture of hope, of trust, of obedience. As Moses wrote in Psalm 90, he said, God, teach me to number my days so I can live wisely. Why did he say that? He wasn't being fatalistic. It was a posture of what I do during this short time on earth can determine eternity. It can affect eternity by those I love, by those I serve. When we live with the eternal perspective, our posture towards God changes. Number two, our position towards possessions changes. As it's been said, you, can, you will not find a funeral hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer. <laughs> Heaven convinced people. Heaven convinced people regard everything they have on earth as an investment in heaven. Our possessions become not something to be stockpiled here as symbols of our significance, comparing what we have to others. As someone said, if the grass is greener on the other side, you can bet their water bill is higher too. In 1993, I want to show you this picture. There were wildfires in the Laguna Hills in California. Houses just demolished. Look at this picture. There was one exception. There was one home constructed with a roof with concrete tile. 
The fire tested the roof, found it inflammable, and skipped over it to the homes with cedar shake shingles. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote that there are various kinds of materials that we can build the foundation of our lives on. Gold and silver, jewels, and also we can do it with sticks and hay and even straw that are very flammable. And he says, one day we will stand before God and all of our work will be put through the fire. Every workman will have, who, who has built his foundation, Paul writes, with the right materials, his house will stand. But if the house burns down, there's great loss. Paul says, we will be saved because of grace, but we'll we'll escape like a man escaping through a wall of flames. What Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 3 is simply this. Paul says, our earthside activities and resources that have been used for eternal gain will endure as though they were gold, silver, and precious gold, like that tile roof. All other things will burn as if there would. Theologian Francis Schaeffer has a term called ash heap Christians. He says, many people do not necessarily live evil lives, but their stay on earth simply has no effect on eternity. Schaeffer notes that there will be many standing before Christ one day, knee deep in ash with empty hands to bring to their Savior. You know, this is the exciting part. With an eternal view, with an eternal view, our possessions become exciting possibilities of ways we can change eternity. Just a few months ago, friends, don't forget this. A little startup church named Live 58 raised over $5,000 to liberate and give over 100 families clean water for life. That has affected people for eternity. Jesus' life was spared as a baby because three wise men gave their resources in worship to the baby Jesus. Those expensive gifts, frankincense, gold, myrrh, enabled Joseph and Mary, who lacked resources, to be able to afford a long journey and residence to Egypt for two years to escape the wrath of a jealous Herod who had decreed that all two-year-old boys throughout the land would be killed. Let me just say it again. With an eternal view, our possessions, the blessings God has given us, become exciting possibilities of ways we can change eternity. Number three, first, our posture towards God's changes with an eternal view. Our position towards possessions change. And number three, our perception of people change. With an eternal view, our perception of people change. Christ constantly elevated the value of human beings. Why? It's because that's why he came. And people are the only things that will last for eternity. Everything else stops at the border. When we begin to live life with an eternal view, our perception of people change from commodities to be used or sold or judged or looked down upon to their being eternal creatures in need of the redemptive touch of God's grace. With an eternal view, a father who looks at his daughter with that eternal view will choose not to abuse her with words or humiliate her because he wants to do everything possible through his actions to draw her closer to Christ. With eternity in mind, business people act ethically both because it's the right thing to do and it will open up people's hearts towards heaven. With eternity in mind, Christians will love one another and do whatever it takes to live in unity, both because it's right and because the Bible says it will open up people's hearts towards heaven. With eternity in mind, Christians will make sure they don't become an introverted club deciding who is in and who is out. And with eternity in mind, Christians will sacrifice serving the poor and marginalized, fighting injustice and taking care of those who cannot take care of themselves. Hmm. A very deep theologian once said this, Christians are like manure. Spread them around the country, throughout the countryside, and you do a lot of good. Pile them all up together in one place, and they get to stinking. One of the things I love about Live 58 Church is Very, very soon, we're going to be able to gather on Sundays, to gather in a building, to worship, to connect one another. But our philosophy at Live 58 is we're going to gather on Sundays and then scatter the rest of the week. We're going to scatter into our neighborhoods, into our workplace. We're going to scatter and go love the people God has put in front of us. People, people matter to God because everything else stops at the border. 
The last one is this. When we live with an eternal view, our posture towards God changes, our position towards possessions change, our perception of people changes. And the last one is our perspective on pain changes. Our perspective on pain changes. Someone said to experience pain means you are alive. Another person said a, a heart that hurts is a heart that works. How many of you today would say based on those two sayings that you are really alive, that your heart is really working? Because there's a lot of pain in this world. But when we live with an eternal view, we realize pain in our life does not mean God loves us any less. Pain in our lives show us that God is at work and he is alongside us. There's a famous story about a young man who ran around with the wrong crowd, ended up being part of a gang. He ended up killing people, a lot of regrets, but he did it out of wanting to fit in and kind of wanting to feel superior. As he got older, he had an encounter with Christ and he left the gang and the gang then ended up ridiculing and beating him up and abandoning him and he spent the rest of his life being hunted down and eventually he was put in prison and he was killed for his beliefs. And this is what this man wrote towards the end of his life. Therefore, I do not lose heart. Though outwardly I'm wasting away, yet inwardly I am being renewed day by day. For my light and momentary troubles are achieving for me an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So I fix my eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Hmm. German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, when he was led to be hung in the face of Nazis, spoke these last words, Oh God, this is the end, but for me... It's just the beginning. D.L. Moody on his deathbed said, soon you will read in the newspaper that I am dead. Don't believe it for a moment. I will be more alive than ever before. And his last words were, earth recedes, heaven opens up for me. Randy Alcorn in his book, Seeing the Unseen, writes this. What if one day, what if one day we discover that God has wasted nothing in our life here on earth? What if we see that every agony was part of giving birth to an eternal joy? I've written about this, but I don't think I've ever shared this out loud in a message. But a few years ago, my temporary view of life was causing me to really struggle with my faith. I was in a convalescent home visiting one of the most heroic, caring, and compassionate humans who had ever lived. Her name was Rose, and she was 95 years of age, and she had had a stroke, broke her hip, and was in failing health. It was hard for me to see this saint living in pain, lying there fighting for her life. Rose had driven her car until the age of 92. She was always full of energy and joy. She cared about everyone. She prayed for everyone. Many of you she prayed for. She was a bright light in a dark world. She had a permanent smile on her face which glowed brighter every year she grew older. Rose was an eternal optimist, not because she was in denial of bad things, but because she believed that God was always at work, always forgiving, redeeming, patiently loving people towards him. She mentored young moms, praying for warring nations, and cared deeply for the poor. We called her our own Mother Teresa, but it was her blue eyes with the genuine smile which penetrated the hardest hearts and opened up the possibility of discovering God's healing and salvation. So here, here is this grace-filled 95-year-old woman struggling for life in a convalescent home. And I'm struggling. God, this isn't fair. She's been so faithful. She shouldn't have to die like this. Where is the dignity in this, God? She deserves better. As I stood around the bed with her family, I struggled silently with these emotions. I'd lost my perspective of eternity. The next morning, I'm driving, thinking about Mother Rose, and I'm listening to a song by the band U2 called Yahweh. And in the song, there's a simple yet very poignant phrase which says this, take this soul stranded in skin and bones, take this soul and make it sing. Yahweh, Yahweh, there is always pain before a child is born. 
As I'm driving, tears began to run down my face and I began to smile involuntarily. My temporary view of life was being gently refocused to the eternal. I was missing the beauty of transition. Because friends, today, all of us, we are all stranded in skin and bones, and our souls are much bigger than our bodies. And here was Mother Rose, a soul filled with love and tenderness, light and hope, and yet she was trapped in skin and bones which were failing her. And yet her soul was not fading. It was becoming brighter. It was getting closer and closer to being set free to live forever without the pain and restrictions of these earthly tents. And all of a sudden, I got excited. Mother Rose's soul was about ready to be set free. No more pain or frustration. It was ready to sing. And then the second part of the phrase of that song, there's always pain before a child is born, came screaming at me. Just like the pain of childbirth is forgotten when the joy and the gift of the child is born, so will Mother Rose's pain be forgotten when she is birthed into new life. And the light went on. On this side of eternity, we're all involved in childbirth. That's why life can be so painful. Disease, sickness, abuse, injustice, prejudice, disappointment. It fills our life with pain. It's called birthing pains. But those birthing pains called life lead us to the other side of eternity where the Apostle John says, there will be no more tears, no more pain, no more war, no more injustice, no more sickness, no more disease. There's always pain before a child is born. This is why people who have done world-changing things always knew that before something great was born, there would be pain. Martin Luther bore the rejection and perjury of religion so the understanding of grace could be born. Abraham Lincoln bore the pain of rejection, anger, and ultimately death so freedom could be born. Martin Luther King Jr. bore the pain of prejudice, hatred, and ultimately death so the beginning of equality could be born. Nelson Mandela bore the pain of 30 years of imprisonment so the end of apartheid could be born. Moses, Moses, he bore the pain of giving up his riches. Standing up against Pharaoh and leading a hard-headed people through the wilderness so a new nation could be born. And Jesus bore the pain of an excruciating death on a cross so redemption and eternal life could be born. There is always pain before something great is born. Friends, our souls are trapped temporarily in skin and bones. But one day, our souls will soar. Our souls will sing. You see, life is very, very difficult when we live with a temporary view. But life begins to make more sense with the perspective of an eternal view. Our posture towards God changes. Our position on possessions change. Our perception of people changes. And even our perspective on pain changes. God bless you, Mother Rose. For you kept your eyes on Jesus, and today her soul soars and sings. May we follow her example. For Moses, for Moses thought it was better to suffer for the promised Christ than to own all the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking forward to the great reward that God would give him. Friends, here lies that reward. Here lies the great mystery that those who choose to live with an eternal perspective will one day be a part of a party of all parties. It says in Luke chapter 12, there will be great joy for those who are ready and waiting for his return. He himself will sit them and put on a waiter's uniform and serve them as they sit and eat. For those living with an eternal perspective, one day Jesus will throw a party for us. And remember, Jesus is good at turning water into wine. So that's going to be some party this week. This week, when you're tempted to live with the perspective that we are just skin and bones, remember Moses. Remember Mother Rose. Remember the words of the PGA chaplain. We're in the land of the dying. We're heading towards the land of the living, where our souls will soar and sing. 
and remember the party of all parties. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal.